Hi, I'm Manish Thavan with my good friend Puneet Khurana. We run a blog by the name of stoicinvesting.com. This is our podcast series. Life is too short to learn from just your own experiences. To inculcate vicarious learning, we will be interviewing and profiling interesting people from different walks of life. Hopefully, this endeavor will shorten the learning curve for our audience. Our guest today is Ankur Jain, an engineering graduate who did his MBA from MDI. Ankur studied under Professor Sanjay Bakshi, who as we all know, is an authority on value investing in India. His association with Professor did not end there. He went on to work with him at Tactica Capital. After honing his skills for almost a decade there, he is now on his own, managing money for himself and clients. As you will hear in this podcast, Ankur is one of the most thorough professionals I have come across. Due to the concentrated nature of his portfolio, he does not leave any stone unturned in his research on a company. Without further ado, let's listen in. Ankur, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Manish. Thank you, Puneet. And um, so he belongs to that pure Warren Buffett fan club which is also evident from the jacket he's wearing today <laughs> <laughs> the Berkshire Hathaway jacket <laughs> so uh, so uh, let's let's start from the start uh, how do you how did you start with the whole value investing or investing per se was it like you entered stock markets earlier and then you got into value investing and how did it all start uh well it started long back i mean uh, while i was in the school so uh, i used to use see my father investing in mutual funds and i used to see my father i mean uh investing in filling up forms for ipos of companies and that was the uh, um, the harshad mehta time 92 93 so i used to have a lot of animated discussions inside our house where his friends would come over and they would speak about you know the next ipo or maybe they'll talk about reliance so i used to get a lot of i used to get fascinated by the talks which used to circle about a lot of companies and uh, so later on i mean that moved on to because some of these all these companies have some products so as as an adolescent boy i used to get very fascinated by the products that these companies are making and the very understanding that these products have companies behind them so that used to make me tick that what is this i mean uh, there is a company and you can have an ownership in this company by having a few shares one defining moment i would say was the morgan stanley morgan stanley 90 i think the morgan stanley open mutual fund which came i think it came in 94 so there was so much of euphoria and there was so much of, of talk about that mutual fund that i actually stood in the queue to submit the form for the ipo so i mean that was one defining memory because at that time psu banks used to collect the forms for those for that mutual fund and everybody was saying you know if you buy it for 10 rupees and the, on listing it's a little double so everybody around me in my family uh, my father's friends they were all investing in that uh, mutual fund so i went early in the morning because there was so much of rush i went i think at 5 o'clock in the morning to stand in the queue and by the time the bank opened at around 9:30 or 10 i was able to submit my application uh, how how old were you uh, then i was in class 8 okay so uh, you i mean but you know see the euphoria itself was so captivating and the whole uh, concept of paperwork because every time because there used to be these long lengthy forms which one has to fill and one has to read so uh, it also you know uh, set up some kind of uh, the need for diligence before you sign up a form you read up on a company and they have these Uh, initial uh, risk factors which they have mentioned so it was quite early for me but yes i mean th- that i would say was the seed which was planted okay. the interest in the i would say the interest and the uh, a magnetic pull was created that there is something out there called the financial securities called the companies the products you get up in the morning and you look at a, you know you are brushing your teeth and you think about a colgate palmolive because this is a share which my father is holding so that is what created or i would say planted the first seed okay. but were you aware of this happening to you at that time or is it in the hindsight no no this is experience? precisely in the hindsight yeah. precisely in the hindsight at that time it was only about you know a, a, some interesting thing which is going on right. which is different from what you discuss in the school in the right. 
probably you're not aware that it's a profession that you can do it full time. Oh, not at all, not at all. Okay. It was just a side activity which my father was doing and I wanted to imitate that. Right. And uh, the, uh, the share certificates which used to come in paper form. So it was all, I mean, I would say a fascination right. for these things. Uh, the second milestone, I would say, when I moved to the engineering college and this, this passion or this habit of reading about the financial uh, companies or uh, different companies, it, it carried on with me. And that is the first time when I requested my father to give me some amount of money so that I can open my own account. Okay. Because till that time, my father resisted uh, to give me you know, the freedom to operate on my own. This is 1998. Yeah, 97, 98. So that is the time when I uh, purchased 10,000, uh, I mean, uh, I borrowed 10,000 rupees from my father. Quite a healthy sum for that time. Uh, yeah, I mean, he was and quite generous. <laughs> and, and, and with a special recommendation from my mother, because I was so, you know, I was so after both of them to give me money, and my father was resisting that I will not, uh, uh, I will not be focusing on my education. If you don't give me money. No, no, if no, I give him money, I mean, he'll get into the, the yeah, yeah. So he'll get into the habit of trading in stocks, so and he'll not focus on his education. But the re recommendation from my mother, I mean, that loosened the purse string, and I got ten thousand bucks. And I was doing textile engineering at that time. I was studying textile engineering. So the obvious companies which came to my mind that I should invest in a company which is into textiles, okay. and and the best company at that time was Bombay Dime. Okay. Where were you studying? I was studying in uh, Regional Engineering College, Jalandhar. Which is now an NIT, so NIT Jalandhar. So I, that was the first stock which I bought, and I had no clue at all about, you know, I just knew that it is Bombay Dying. It's a, it's a well-known name in the textile arena, and I'm a, text, I'm studying textile, so I should stay, I should buy companies which are uh, closer to my field of education. Right. And I just saw the price in the newspaper; it was 40 bucks, and I went ahead and uh, bought shares worth 10,000 rupees of Bombay Dying. So that was my first purchase. From the way starting, you are a high allocator. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that was also the point of ignorance. I mean, you don't know about you know so many other things, the diversification, the risk, and how much can you lose? The maximum that you can lose is ten thousand bucks. Okay. Okay. So I just so went ahead and. So what happened with that? Position? I mean, within a few weeks, the stock was quoting at fifty-two, and I was on the top of the world, and I immediately went ahead and sold all of it. So you have yeah, I mean, 40 to 52, so it's like not bad, 30 yeah. percent. And I took that extra 3,000 rupees to my mother, and I said, "Okay, this is what I want from Bombay Dye." And then she said, "Leave engineering and do this." Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. So that carried on for some time. So I had now this capital of 12, 13,000, and I kept on investing in a few. I mean, buying a few shares, selling a few shares after a few days, and uh, get, just getting the thrill out of it. And, and what was the premise of buying all this time? There was no premise. It was just a textile company, okay. and I know the brand. Okay. Or, or rather, I would say I have heard the name. Okay. The stock is available at 40, 50 rupees. It's not expensive, so let's just go and buy. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So that is how I started. And later on, uh, uh, but at the same time, the I would say my mind was ignited about reading about financial. I mean, the financials of companies. So I used to spend a lot of time, though it 80% uh, or 90% of whatever I would read wouldn't make any sense to me. It will just be, uh, it will go over my mind. But still, I would consistently read the financial newspapers. Well, it's a pretty interesting thing that you say, Ankur. Uh, and uh, although this question was probably for later, but uh -huh. I'll ask. Uh, you're saying that you started reading about financial statements. And you're also admitting that at that point of time, Majority of the stuff was going over your head. Uh, my question is, doesn't that demotivate you? No, no. I, I, I would just correct you who were there because it was not. I was not reading financial statements. Okay. I was reading financial newspapers. Okay. 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 Let me rephrase this. Yeah, yeah. Even that financial newspaper thing was going over your head. Mm -hmm. That's what you said. Right? Yeah. But most of it. you motivated them to go back at it. Well, I mean, I, I would say that it was something, something kind of a black box, and because it sounded so complex, uh, the more I didn't understand and the more complex I found it, you know, the more urge was within me to, to, to crack the code or to figure out what is going on. Inquisitiveness. Yeah, the inquisitiveness, the curiosity. Interesting. And more so, I would also say because there was not nothing, you know, 
nothing else to do. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. so this is what I can relate with because probably the similar thing happened. Yeah. I was in second year and I, I think the first time I picked up a business magazine and I'm talking about 2003, I think. Yeah. And uh, at that time, Business World was the magazine which was five rupees. Right. So it was the cheapest magazine at that time so I bought that. And just because it wasn't making sense, I became more, you know, uh, that Lured. I to understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And especially as an engineer, you have this, I don't know, if, I think it comes in your, uh, you're trying to find a logical step as to how this thing moves and reach a conclusion. Well, I would also say, yeah, I mean, that's true, Puneet. One more thing, because, you know, I don't know, but whatever we used to hear from our seniors, you have to make your CV impressive. Right. And you have to, you know, write things right. which are different from others right. and make the interviewers uh, look, look at you in a different right. light. Yeah. So how do you do that? You have to, you know, right. get handle on some jargons. Sure. So that, that I would say, I mean, because uh, in the extracurriculars, there was nothing else to write. Right. And if, so I thought maybe I should pick up this reading and reading what? you know, economic times or maybe a financial uh, newspaper or a business magazine. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah, uh, so. yeah. Horse riding as a hobby would not get you as much brown, brown, brownie points as uh, reading financial papers for sure, yeah. And because also it was reachable, because lo a lot of other activities, you know, require a lot of effort, passion, sure. they require sure. investment of money, time. Sure. So this was an easy alternative to impress your interviewers. Right. So that is I, what I would say, I mean, right. that is how I, I, I just kept on reading. And subsequently to that, I carried the, carried the, continued doing that when I went to MDI. So I had a demat account. Immediately joined MDI after graduation or you have some work experience? No, no, I, I, I got through Tata Consultancy Services in my engineering final year, but there was the IT uh, crash which happened. And uh, just to relate one example, you know, uh, an instance which happened about, uh, to figure out the IT euphoria at that time, so all the companies that came to our campus, they were recruiting people for coding and IT. Right. And right from the very start, I have not been very comfortable with technology. Okay. So. Uh, Is it the case even now? Uh, yeah, somewhat. I mean, I have improved a lot. I have improved a lot, I mean, in my own perspective, but still, I mean, as compared to my peers, I mean, okay. that's a big handicap. So Tata Consulting, but, uh, but those, I mean, IT companies were the only companies which are coming to recruit the campus. And I still remember that uh, there was an ad in the newspaper. They wanted people who are engineers. And the branch was not specified. So I called up the company and I said, you know, I'm a textile engineer. I'm an engineer. And uh, I'm also a textile engineer. I clarified that I'm a textile engineer because textile was usually a branch which was not accepted okay. for recruitments. Mechanical, electrical, and even civil was civil. Niche. It was a niche branch, so it was not. Uh, we were not allowed to sit for the interviews. Sure. So I called up this company and said, "I just want to specify that I'm a textile engineer." So the lady at the uh, on the other side said, "You know, we don't really care. Even if you are a garbage engineer, that is fine with us." <laughs> 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 so she said, "I mean, you know, even if you have done garbage engineering, that doesn't matter. As long as you have 16 years, 12 plus 4." years of education, which allows you to get a US visa, we can train you on coding. Uh, this is year 2001. This is, I think, around 2000, so 1992. Yeah, yeah. Third, year. Yeah. third or final year, when that, I, I can, yeah, I mean, the IT boom was at its peak. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a time, I mean, there was so many advertisements, and we used to joke in our college that if you start a company, just write dot com after your company, and yeah, you'll get the funding. Not the funding, but you'll get a job, or, you know, you can make millions. And you can, it was not about funding, but it was more about that you can list the company. So, so I could hear, I mean, you know, I could hear these discussions and I would, uh, in the final year itself, that you start a company, just put dot com after that and you can list it and you can make millions. <laughs> Interesting. So. Uh, it wasn't wrong, by the way. Well, I mean, it continued for some time, yes. So when I got through TCS, uh, so I had very, uh, quite mixed feelings about it. I was happy that I've got a job, but I'm also unhappy because I've got a job in IT industry which, which I don't have a flair for. So I couldn't see future for myself that, I mean, um, um, how am I going to excel in this industry? And it was a godsend opportunity when the IT 
bust happened okay. and they withdrew all the offers. <laughs> so TCS withdrew all the offers and when I received a letter at my home saying that, you know, we regret that we cannot absorb you and good luck for your next career. So I was quite happy, but I didn't show my happiness to my parents, but I was quite happy about it. And by that time, I had already started preparing for my management, sure. management education. The CAT exam. The CAT exam. So I was already mid, uh, you know, midway into it. And fortunately, I got through MBI. So, so you joined MBI which year? I joined MBI in 2002. 2002. Yeah. And the uh, bug about investing continued. So I continued to invest in a few companies. Again, same thing. I mean, I would buy uh, shares of a company which I've heard about or I, there's a recommendation in a newspaper. Some columnist had uh, written about it. So I would buy the share and a few days after that, I mean, I would simply sell it. And 2003-04 was the starting of the, the bull run. So any stock you buy, it will go 30-40% in a few weeks. So that was, I would say, the second booster dose. Because, you know, you require right. confidence. confidence. And then the big thing happened. I mean, I wanted to major in finance because I saw that as a natural progression. So I had to take a few credits which were majorly in finance. So I, I, I saw on the notice board that there is a course called SABV, Security Analysis and Business Valuation. So, so I mean, naturally I got quite pulled towards that course. Sure. So I joined that course. I, I, I mean, I took up that credit. And till that time, uh, you know, I hadn't quite found my groove in MBA. It was just, I was just cruising along, I mean, just doing the courses, but with no, uh, there was a lot of haziness in terms of which particular area you find attractive. Yeah, got it. I mean, I can get into marketing, yes, I can get into finance, yeah, I, I think I can do that also. Can I do a mix of the both? Yes, I, I think I can do a mix of both also. So there was no clarity about what you are going to do in future. So when I joined this course of SABV and the first lecture was there, so uh, Professor Bakshi was there, so he introduced the course. And the first company, the first slide he put on the board was about a company where he had invested. It was a deep value stock. And he mentioned the name of the company, Himmat Singhaka Side. Right? So he said, I don't think anybody of you would have heard the name of this company. So I just raised my hand. I said, no, I have heard about the name of this company. It's a you know, company based out of Bangalore and it is into silk and the okay. silk. That silk. was your domain expertise anyways. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Because, and, and more so because one of my batchmates had done his training in, in Himmat Singh Kasi Day. Okay. And she had given a presentation on it in our class when I was in textile engineering. Okay. So somehow the dots connect. And uh, so when he said Himmat Singh Kasi Day, and I said, you know, I have heard about it and they supply curtains to White House and so many other places. So he said, okay, I'm wrong. I take a point. There is one person who has <laughs> heard about Himmat Singh Kassid in this class. So I think that was the first connection which I had and I completely uh, fell in love with uh, the way he explained the company, the dividend yield, the cash on the books and when he invested in that company, it was actually selling at a discount to cash and quite a healthy dividend. Uh, with good brand name, good pro portfolio of their products, sure. good customer penetration. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so that is uh, when my you were at that point in yeah, I, I got completely hooked to it. Uh, if I'm not wrong, wasn't 2003 your batch? Uh, uh, was the first batch or second batch by Professor Bakshi? I am not so sure. Uh, okay. Maybe okay. I am not so sure. I don't know. I somehow have this. Think in my mind that you started this course, PSBB, SABB at your time, and then later on. No, 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 PSBB. no, no, no. Yeah, I mean the course was named SABB, yeah. but it was not surely the first batch. That much I know. It was not so the first the batch. The behavioral finance concept, the part of that course came later. Because Possibly. From yeah. what I remember, BSBB starts with no discussion of any stocks whatsoever, ah, right. and then it. I, I'm not sure at that time whether it was a two-part. Uh, course or one just one course in one semester one trimester no no they were two uh, they the were course two was spread across two, two trimesters yeah. so yeah so in our case the first lecture in fact the first series of lecture was only on the behavioral finance side with no mention of any stocks okay so on the contrary his first slide in our case was i'm not here to teach you valuations <laughs> <laughs> slide and yeah so yeah but i think he made the course bfb related 
I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. In fact, it, this is pretty interesting. Uh, as a third person here, I am uh, noting an uncanny similarity. You know, engineering graduation and then work with TCS and <laughs> then MDI uh, and then value investing for life. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, uh, so let me ask you this. Um, you're, you are hooked in the second year when you were studying with Professor Bakshi and you, you primarily at that time you were sure that okay this is something which I want to do. Uh, what was the next progression? Did you go through what he talked about and then he, you studied it in detail or the study part happened later when you joined him and how did you join him? First of all, that would be a good question. Um, how come you went to work with him? Did it happen immediately after college? No, no, I joined Axis Bank from the campus. Yeah, okay. which was UTI Bank at that time. So I, I worked there for uh, five, five, six months. And which profile was this? It was general profile. I mean, I was a management trainee. Okay. So I was given training under different divisions. Sure. And uh, so sometime in December 2004 is when uh, Professor Bakshi decided to, uh, was planning to manage investments for other people. Okay. Till that time, I think he was doing it for his own. He was just managing his own money. Sure. So around December 2004, I mean, uh, he picked up a few people from my senior batch, from my batch, and from my junior batch. Okay. So I was quite fortunate in that sense that, uh, so he, he called me up and for discussions. So we had discussions about starting up a company and I was quite thrilled. If I can ask you, who all were there in that initial team? Yeah. So there was uh, Jagpreet, Jagpreet, Jagpreet Singh Bhatia, and uh, he, he was one year senior to me. He was from my senior batch in MDI. And uh, there was Sharoni Ray. She was one year junior to me. So we were three people, and Professor Bakshi. So we started Tactica. Uh, so from uh, whatever I know, at that point in time, uh, from all the articles I have read from Professor Bakshi and you know, whatever we have been taught also during that course. I think at that time he was very fascinated with the concept of uh, the whole idea of buying assets cheap. Right. So speak. Uh, right. The grand style of investing. Right. Uh, so take us through your learning process. Um, when you joined him, you must have studied by then, I'm assuming, that you were you studied the Warren Buffett letters or the security analysis, whatever he referred at that time in the class. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. But you must have had a uh, something in your mind that okay this is how it works how different what was it a, you know was it for you when you went there and joined him so, and practice was his theory is my question and second is was it from the very starting that uh, what you have studied made sense immediately or you practice something else uh, let's say a special situations or quality company that price what was what was the starting point of your investments So during one of his lectures, uh, Professor Bakshi, you know, mentioned about a case of delisting of Com Compaq. Was it Compaq or was it some other company, which I think HP acquired? Yeah, it was Compaq. Uh, Compaq. No, no. Uh, uh, Compaq was another company which they acquired uh, universally, globally. But I think in India they acquired another company, which is called I think, I'm not able to recall the name, but. Basically, there was a delisting case where HP acquired this company, and I think the name started with D. Okay, so HP acquired this company, okay. and uh, there was a delisting. Uh, so Professor Bakshi, I mean, he uh, uh, took a lecture on that particular situation and how he thought about it. That why HP is going to pay something extra to acquire this company, and so that that was very fascinating. I mean, I found it very very fascinating that uh, there are situations in the market which are are not related to the market, right. movements of the market, and where you can apply a different kind of logic uh, to figure out the risks and also the possible returns. Where it, uh, you, you can figure out what is the risk reward ratio right. in a particular situation and still unrelated to the market. So I got very, very fascinated by that particular example. And I started looking on my own, some examples to look on my own. And the very first thing which I did was to scan through BSE announcements. So that was my, I, I would say, the first screen which I started to uh, read on a regular basis. Because so there are so many corporate annou announcements which are coming on a daily basis. And uh, the 
Also, importantly, it is fact. Whatever you read on an announcement, because it is coming from an exchange, it is a fact. Right. Different, very different from what you read in a newspaper, which is possibly partially fact and partially fiction. Yeah, can be a rumor. Too. Can be a rumor. I mean, so that was one very a key differentiating factor because you are reading in black and white what has been given to the exchange. Sure. So I came across a case of Rayban Sun Optics. Uh, so Luxottica, the uh, company of Italy, they had uh, bought over Rayban and there was a takeover regulation which said that if you acquire a company globally and that company also has uh, subsidiary operations in India, so there has to be an open offer made to the shareholders of the company. And there was a dispute about the open offer price, right. about the price that has to be given to the shareholders of Rayban India. So I took out that announcement and I did some due diligence and I did some um, homework on it and I brought it to the uh, attention of Professor Bakshi that this is a corporate announcement which is going on and you know the, the open offer is at 108, right. uh, 108 a share and uh, the price in the market is 70 rupees and plus there is an interest kicker also inbuilt into it. The, uh, the later they pay, the more interest they have to shell out the company has to shell out to the shareholders. Right. So I brought it to his attention and he uh, went through my thesis and he find it very uh, interesting. So he spoke about that case in the class and he also announced in the class that he's going to invest 20 lakh rupees into that idea. So I was on cloud nine, you know. <laughs> right. I mean, 20 lakh rupees, you know, because you may have found an idea First of all, you don't understand the worth of it. Right. Then an, an authority on investing, he founds the idea equally attractive right. and, able, and is able to figure out the uh, loopholes or maybe uh, find holes in the theory right. and, and uh, based on a risk reward ratio decide to invest 20 lakh rupees in it and announce in front of the class. So what I, better way of patting you on the back? Precisely. Right. So that gave me a, a big moral booster. If I can ask this. Um, this is from the corpus he was managing for other people? That I don't know. No, no, I, I was not working along with at that time. I was just a student. So he said, I'm going to invest oh, okay. in this idea. Oh, so immediately this happened within that span of your class? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Maybe that's, uh, probably that's the reason he called you after six months. Yes, yes. One of the big reasons. Okay. And also because of a lot of affection he had. Sure, sure. I mean, I'm just saying that the yeah. was built at that point in time. Precisely, yeah. So it was. It all started in steps. So my love, or my, you know, the, the pull towards this particular craft, it all uh, started with these milestones. When you say the craft, do you mean value investing? Yes. Or do you mean, uh, investing. investing. No, no. Investing is a craft. Investing is a craft. Yeah. yeah. And uh, were you just because of this particular event? Were you more inclined towards uh, delisting and risk arbitrage kind of situations? Uh, well, yes. I mean, it was uh, a morale booster. And it also gave me the uh, some kind of an inkling that there is a niche in the market where a lot of players are not looking at this, right. and two, a lot of players maybe are not keen on this. keen on doing the amount of homework which is required to do. Right, sure. right. Sure. And I also found that uh, I have a flair for reading these uh, um, documents when it comes to legal documents. So I, I mean, usually a lot of people find them boring, but I don't find them boring. I mean, I find them very uh, refreshing. Forensic stuff. Forensic stuff. Right. So, so yeah, that that was it. And when I uh, started uh, to work more on open offers and delistings and special situations, litigated matters. So every uh, case that I worked on, it gave me more insights. Sure. There were more. Uh, mistakes to be figured out, sure. more risks to be figured out, more understanding of risks, Th that is how it went. Sure. So, uh, so you know, within value investing, um, there are various subsets. One is the deep value, buying companies at very cheap, uh, I mean, with proportion of their asset values, you buy them very cheap. Um, the second sect may be uh, something like what Warren Buffett practices of growth at reasonable price, uh, kind of a quality companies with decent growth mm -hmm. and available at a very reasonable price. Mm -hmm. um, you know, then there is the risk, uh, risk arbitrage as a complete uh, sect altogether. Right. Uh, what were the dominant sections you were operating in in the initial phase of career? And has it changed 
so is it very different from what you're doing now? What has been your progression in that sense? With the so, oil investing stuff? Okay. So earlier I used to do, you know, uh, everything. I used to invest in a deep value stock also. I used to invest in a risk arbitrage situation also. Okay. I would study up on a debt restructuring exercise. Right. So the good quality company, I would say, was not a set at that time where I was, you know, keenly looking at. I didn't had an understanding what a good com company actually comprises. Okay. For me, a good brand was a good company. Fair and that is equal to good investment. So that raw was the understanding. So I didn't operate in the area of investing in companies which or businesses which have high entry barriers around them. The so-called moats. Yeah. So I used to buy deep value. I used to uh, invest in special sets. And yeah, everything, cyclical, non-cyclical, everything included. So I would say it was a portfolio of 40, 50, 60 stocks. So just for the benefit of the listeners, uh, can I assume that what Professor Bakshi uh, explained in his speech uh, to Mr. Chetan Parekh in his interview, that Oxford interview, and he has given a lot of themes there. Uh, uh, I'm sure you must have read that also. Right. Uh, was that also the way you were operating? All those themes were probably the way you were looking at the companies. So there was a raw material theme, and then there was a debt restructuring theme, and then there's a cash bargain, debt capacity bargain, and a lot of things he has explained in that uh, uh, in that interview. And I will probably attach the interview in the notes of this podcast also. But uh, was that the true resemblance of what you were doing at that point in time? Well, so I. But there was no mention of quality in that. Yes. So I I I do I don't have very concrete memories about that interview right now. Okay. But yes, we used to invest in a lot of different themes and we didn't used to start looking at a company because of the theme sure. i mean the comp sure. the company would fit into some theme later on right. but we are looking at a steel company and we are looking at a preference share was there a way to zero down to how you reached that company at the first place? yeah we used to use the software cmi Provis. Okay. we used so to use Provis. yeah we used to have screens okay. uh, figuring out companies which have debt capacity i mean which are debt capacity sure. bargains companies sure. which are Showing decline in the interest which is being paid, sure. showing debt reduction, companies which are coming up on the dividend list for the first time, sure. companies which are having low price to book value. So all these things, I mean, all these screens we used to have. Sure. So a lot of companies used to be thrown up for working. Sure. And in addition to that, I mean, uh, your cost, continuous reading of newspapers and magazines and speaking with fellow investors also used to give us, uh, I would say, good fertile ground for ideas. So there was enough to work in every theme. Right. <laughs> so, so take us you know, uh, through the journey of uh, has the way of operation in which you're operating earlier, has it changed now? Are you in the different field altogether, so to speak? Uh, or are you doing the same capacity, cash bargains? Because I know, I mean, practice, practically it's very, very difficult to find statistically cheap and uh, cheap on assets companies at this point in time. Correct. Uh, so. Has the evolution of the market made you change and look into some other areas? Uh, how, is, how, how has your journey progressed in that time? So, I mean, uh, if I just look 10 years back, I used to uh, invest in all sorts of companies. Right. And there used to be 40 to 50 companies in my portfolio. Okay. At this point of time, I have seven companies in my portfolio. Earlier, we also, I used to take cash calls that this is the cash, you know, which is compulsorily I have to keep in my portfolio, okay. which I no longer do. Okay. So there is, there is no cash call which I take depending on the direction of the market. And we used to read a lot about direction of the market. At least I used to read a lot what other people are saying, which I have stopped doing. Okay. So now coming back to, yeah, second, yeah. Uh, just to clarify that point, can hmm. you say you would take calls about how much cash to keep? Yeah depending on other people's views of where the market is? Well, I would say other people's views, I mean, you'll read what other people are saying and also then uh, okay. have some your own view on the market. Else. Yeah, but yeah. My point is that, uh, so have you stopped giving any uh, heed to the other people's view only or have you stopped looking at nifty values or levels completely entirely? I mean, no, I have never looked at nifty values and the multiples. When you say the direction of the market, you mean what? I mean, I mean, whether the market is going to go up or down, in the in the medium so term. You no know, view on the market at this point in time. No, you don't look at market. Yes. 
and and i found it to be i mean at least in my perspective and it didn't suit my psyche so at least in my perspective i didn't find it to be a very value adding proposition for me interesting so you say you are 100% invested now every time not every time okay. but the criteria for keeping the cash has changed okay. earlier the cri- yeah earlier the, the criteria was that okay i am afraid about the market going down so i want to keep this much amount at least 20% in cash okay. were there a good opportunity to buy right okay. now now the criteria is that if there is a business which you have understood well which uh, uh, is run by very good management and which is available at a valuation which provides me at least 17% irr which is the hurdle rate which i keep in my mind sure so that's a good investment for me sure so that is a satisfactory investment for me and i go ahead and deploy my capital Yeah. Well, probably uh, Akur, would that uh, would there be an exception to this rule if let's say uh, you come across a uh, year 2000 like scenario where you clearly know that the uh, the situation is overheated like uh, IT euphoria or something but would you still be 100% invested uh, no the way i look at it is uh, so i would say there are two aspects to this problem point one is let's say uh, one is 100% invested in the stocks and there is certain intrinsic value which you have calculated for all your positions for all your ideas right now there will be a point in time in that euphoria when the prices will overshoot the intrinsic value by a very long margin yeah. a very very wide margin so so at that point of time yes i would be inclined to sell my positions or or uh, lighten up my positions yeah that's what i wanted to know yeah okay okay so um you know since we are on the topic of your cash allocation is not decided by the markets uh, let me discuss the selling point which i want to discuss later but uh, so if i'm getting it right what you are saying is that the market is not going to decide market levels or market direction is not going to decide whether you are sitting in cash or not maybe your individual company's valuations will decide whether you want to stay with that company or sell out if you're getting uncomfortable with the valuation is that what you're saying can you repeat the second part so so what i'm saying is that um, Essentially, let's say you're hundred percent invested, right? And you have let's say eight companies. Uh, you will sell off a position only when you're getting. I mean, you can sell off for many other reasons, but in the valuation sense, you will sell off only when you're getting uncomfortable with the valuations. Correct. And I and don't have to define your cash position. Right. Than the market. Position. And also the presence or the absence of related opportunities. Fair enough. Got it. Yeah. So, uh, so my next question to you is. Um, what makes you uncomfortable you know in terms of valuation when you say valuation makes me uncomfortable what is it are you talking about are you talking about uh, we, we all know that the markets have a tendency to overshoot in both directions correct so are you talking that okay there are a lot of investors i know like we are having monish pavrai that day at mdi only and uh, he said that i sell at intrinsic value sometime very close to the intrinsic value calculation right uh, do you believe in that part or since you know that the market tends to overshoot mm-hmm. beyond the intrinsic value calculations you give it some leeway and you hold it even if you know that the intrinsic value is lower than the current price how much is too much okay, okay. Much yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I have to ask this question uh, yeah that's a very good question i mean let me just uh think aloud about it sure, sure. and uh, the thoughts evolve with time so th- th- i'll just mention about the present thoughts which i have sure So first of all coming to the intrinsic value we need to be very clear in our own minds how do we calculate the intrinsic value because you know intrinsic value calculation itself might differentiate from person to person definitely and then as graham says it's a range it is not yeah, a number it's never a number in the range can also be quite wide sure sure so i'll just describe how i calculate the intrinsic value for for a particular company i mean given that it checks all the criteria which i have set in place sure it's a good company which i want to invest in so i try to calculate i try to foresee in the future that what is the kind of growth this company has i mean based on the historical past and given the scale of opportunity which this business has and the competitive position of the company sure. what is the very conservative growth which this company can have okay and how much can i foresee because the more i mean the further you go away from the present time the the uh, uh, dim the prospects become the more lesser confident you become about the prospects sure. i mean if i have to chart the growth of a company for the next 3 years maybe 
I can say with 95% confidence. The moment you increase the time period to 10 years, I will say possibly with 85% confidence. The moment you cross it to 15 years, I would say with 70% confidence. So, with every range of uh, you know timeline, the confidence decreases sure. in, in the numbers. So, for me, for certain businesses, the timeline is let's say 8 to 10 years, that I can be reasonably sure about the projections that I put in. Sure. Uh, let me take for example a company where I was invested in, Sera Sanitary Wear. So let's talk about the sanitary business. Sure. I mean, that will help your listeners and also me to, cons uh, to consolid consolidate my thoughts. For example, if you look at sanitary wear, now what is the scale of opportunity for sanitary wear in India? You know, 50% of the population is still defecating in the open. Right. That is point one. And the population is only increasing, no matter which, you know, which, where the dollar is, where the crude oil price is, the population is only increasing at, at around 1% per year. Sure. And out of the existing population, 50% does not have the uh, washroom facility in their house, or they are not using it. Sure. Point number two, people are aspirational. Sure. So right from the very first thing, having a toilet at the, your own home, still in the rural areas, having a toilet at your own home and having a newspaper delivered at your house is considered a very aspirational aspect. Sure. Right. So the second tailwind is the aspirational aspect of the population. Now you can uh, put it along with the, uh, the, the thrust which the government is giving on people to move to move away from open defecation. Swach Bharat, Bharat Abhiyan. The celebrity endorsement which are coming along with it. So there is you know a, a social noise which I would say to get rid of this bad habit. Let me have some clarity here. Yeah. Uh, you are talking about a position which was before the Swachh Bharat announcement happened or you bought Sarah later on? So was the Swachh Bharat a part of your thesis? No, no, no. Swachh Bharat, I mean, previously also, so this has been an ongoing, I would say, governmental yeah. thrust, not only sure. because of Swachh Bharat. Sure. Yeah. Swachh Bharat was earlier known as Nirmal Bharat Abhiyan. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so the, sure. yeah. Right. So, so basic, I, I would say the basic uh, uh, thrust is that people are moving away from open defecation and we have a huge scale of opportunity. 50% of the, 50, 56% of the people are still not, you know, have toilets. That is point number two. And there is a lot of social noise. There is a lot of celebrity endorsement. There is aspiration. There is uh, legal thrust also because the governments, uh, governments and the uh, judiciary also is, you know, the laws are being put in place where you can't find the elections at the gram panchayat levels, at the local levels, if you don't have a toilet at home. Sure. Yeah. Then there are a lot of uh, monetary subsidies which are coming from the government for peop to encourage people sure. to get a toilet. That is point number two about the tailwinds which the sector is facing. Now, if we come to the player's part, there are only three players in the country, in the organized segment. I mean, major share of the organized segment is is captured by the three companies, which is HSIL, Hindustan Sanitary, Periwear, and Sera. Right. There are many other companies, but these three companies capture, I think, 80 to 90 percent of the organized market. Okay. Now, the third point is that in this market, 50 percent of the share, uh, 50 percent share is still unorganized, is captured by unorganized sector. So, where you have, you know, hundreds of units which are spread out in Morbi, Gujarat, sure. and other places. So 50% of the market is captured by the organized segment and 50% is unorganized. Sure. As people are moving towards premiumization, as people are moving towards aspiration to fulfill their aspirational needs, sure. they are moving to buy brands. All right? Sure. So these three companies are major beneficiaries. Right. HSIL, Periwear, and Sera. Now there are different segmentations which these companies have done based on the premium uh, segment, luxury segment or the mass segment, affordable segment, right. a lot of things which they have done. But just to give a general perspective of uh, how, how, you know, how long can you think in terms of time periods, I would say, for example, Sera or a sanitary wear manufacturer, I would say that looking 10 to 15 years ahead in terms of growth is, is a, quite a confident, I would say, metric for me to look at or to assess sure. and also coupled by the fact that entry of any new player whether it is domestic is is extremely difficult because of the kind of entry barriers and the brands and the scale of operations which these three companies have, have created around them sure. 
Sure. So for a fourth or a fifth or a sixth player to come and really challenge these companies is quite, I would say, a remote possibility. And for an international player, again in the mass segment, there are international players who have come up in the luxury segment. You have American Standard, Toto, Kohler has come in. Yeah. But to be in the mass segment, it's very difficult for any other company to come here or a, a Chinese ex player to export here. Sure. Right? What they have done is collaborations with the these companies itself and they, they buy some of their luxury requirements from China. So that gives me a lot of confidence that the sector is experiencing very good tailwinds. Sure. The companies are in a very good position. No new player can come in. The Chinese can't disrupt this market. The bargaining power of suppliers is very, very poor because you are, you know, you are just using uh, clay and you are using uh, other ceramic raw materials which are abundantly available. The bargain, bargaining power of buyers is not high because ultimately they have only three or four brands to select from. There is no pricing regulation from the government. There is no threat of a substitute. There is no technological disruption which can disrupt this company or, or a sanitary wear as a sector. So all in all combined, it gives me, it puts me in a very comfortable position to actually, you know, look ahead 10 to 15 years that this is how this company is going to grow. Sure. That is point, part one of the thesis. The second part of the thesis is that if, you, if I look in the hindsight, this company has grown at quite a fast pace. Right. North of I think 20 to 25% per year in the last five, seven years. But what is the growth rate at which I am comfortable putting it 10 years from now? Now, again, there are two parts to it, the volume part and the value part. Because of the inbuilt inflation, 4 to 5% inflation or 3 to 4% inflation that we can uh, think going forward. Right. So the amount of volume which this company has to do is only 5 to 6%. Interesting. To make for that 10% value proposition. Sure. For the net sales to grow at 10%. Sure. So give, I mean, uh, combine, combining all these factors, I, I feel quite confident about projecting the growth at a rate of 10% or 12% for the next 10, 15 years for this company going forward. Sure. And also looking at the, uh, the, the segment where HSI, I mean, there are you know, further offshoots to this thinking process, but this is the basic idea of looking at a particular sector, looking at a position of a company, looking at the threat of uh, entry of new players, sure. Got it. The, the foreign players, the regulation, the bargaining power of buyers, the bargaining power of suppliers, so once I have come to this kind of uh, insight about a company and I can uh, uh, put the numbers with some confidence, some high degree of confidence, then I take the valuations. Sure. So, so what I'm saying here is there are two kinds of, I would say conservative attitude, which I think I built into this model. One is that I'm not taking a very long period of time. I'm just taking 10 to 15 years. To 10 to 15 is not long, Ankur? Well, it depends on the perspective of an industry. Okay. So that is what I said. I mean, if you ask me for any other industry, uh, for example, I mean, uh, uh, Mr. Buffett just bought this company in the oil sector, right. which supplies, I think, uh, you know, parts of machineries or which are required in the oil sector. Right. And somebody asked him about the view of oil. So he said, we are not buying it for five years. We are buying it for 100 years. Right. Right. So, I mean, if I compare 100 to 10 to 100, that's... Sure. Quite lesser a time. Yeah. Yeah. What's your perspective? So, I mean, um, I'm pretty sure that the commodities and you know, all these kind of com companies uh, essentially will fall out of that framework anyways because 10 years, 15 years kind of outlook is very difficult to have in these kind of commodity driven companies. Well, I would say that, you know, it depends from company to company. If you are looking at pure commodity companies, yes, right. they wouldn't even clear the first hurdle. Right. You look at a raw material supplier, zinc player or a steel player, right. that will fall out of the radar. But again, uh, there are companies which are commodity players in a different sense that they are being able to sell brands to people. Right. They are commodity players, for example, even Pedialyte, I mean, Fevicol, in, yeah. Fevicol, I mean, it's, it's a commodity, but they have this huge knack of creating brands around their commodities. Sure. So that will make a lot of difference. Asian paints. So I wouldn't uh, say categorically that commodity players are sure. out, sure. but I would say that it depends from company to company, sure. and it will simply depend on whether I am able to take a view, long term view, whether I am able to see that this company has pricing power, whether this company would be around, this sector would be around 10 to 15 years from now, sure. 
what is the bargaining power would it be fair to say ankur that uh, for all those companies where you're not able to look 10 years ahead they fall off the radar yes interesting okay uh, so i mean let me go back to the question which we which came into picture was the valuation how much is enough and how much how, you know how much is too yes. much right so so you said you value the company yeah and um, uh, on the basis of a certain level of confidence you put your numbers and you come up with the valuation parameter uh, the valuation number whatever you feel the yeah, yeah. company is and then you buy it yeah uh, What so, is the process ahead? Mm-hmm. So I would say, Puneet. I mean, I would start with a conservative level. Sure. So in some cases, I would say 10% is conservative for me. Okay. Sure. 10%, for example, I told you about Sera. 10%, a 10-year or a 15-year horizon is 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 comfortable for me. Sure. Sure. In some companies that I may not have the idea about going forward 10 years, but I would say for five years I am quite comfortable okay. that this is the kind of growth that this company can come sure. command. Sure. Sure. Right. so uh, it may depend from company to company the time period may also vary from company to company it can be 10 15 5 8 okay yeah sure so yeah so once i have put on these numbers so i derive uh, an uh, intrinsic value of the company uh, again uh, i'm sorry to inter- mm-hmm. uh, interrupt but i'm no just trying to get you know at each each yeah, step yeah, i yeah. verify so the uh, listeners can benefit all this right so the process you're saying uh, are you implying a dcf kind of Uh, you know, model to value companies. When you're saying I put the numbers, you take a sort of a DCF number. It's a DCF, but it doesn't require complicated set of numbers. Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, I it's a DCF. Yeah, yeah, it's a DCF. But, uh, cash yes. Cash flow and growth rate and yes. discount rate. Yes. Yes. So, it's a DCF. It's a DCF. So, yes. do you use free cash flow in your calculation, or do you use earnings as the base, and then you do some kind of adjustments to those? How do you approach the free cash flow number? so what i uh, consider free cash flow in my mind is basically the cash which is left with the company after it has paid you know every stakeholder okay, okay. a lender the okay. the capex which is required to run the current operations of the company and also the government okay. which includes taxes so which means taxes so i mean for me cash flow is finally at the end of the day when you have settled the bill for everybody what is the cash left in your till so that is the cash the technical definition of free cash flow to equity is uh, for me i mean i usually take pat for free, free cash flow, cash flow. Yes. and then adjust it for if i i believe that the depreciation which the company has provided is lower than the actual which i think sure so just to put in the conservative number sure and uh, also i mean i try to normalize if i try to see that uh, what is the tax rate which the company i mean the usual adjustments sure. look out for the tax rate if the company has paid 20% taxes for the last 3 years then you know that there is some kind of you know benefit which the company has got and it is not going to sustain in the long term too. so so to normalize it you have to bring it to 32% tax rate but do you uh, uh, refer to the cash flows vis a vis the pad to see the difference between the accrual accounting how much of a accrual basis things are happening in the company because a lot of in lot of cases there will be some expenses uh, you know which are non cash uh, in nature or non operational in nature so to speak uh, do you get the cash flow perspective here or you just take pat and then uh, adjust it with the depreciation no i would say the valuation is the last uh, process okay. so before that i have uh, uh, compared the company on the f- uh, cash flow in in terms of how different is it from the pat is it different from the pat understood if yes then uh, how much it is different and then why is it different and also the cash flow before working capital changes and after com- uh, working capital changes is there a variance if yes then why is this variance yeah. i mean so all those questions so let me just again for the benefit of listeners just put let me put it in a flow chart sort of a thing yeah. all these things which you are doing is the quality of earnings check so to speak and see whether there's too much of variance and if the variance is there why is there yeah uh, most of the times the variance if it's too consistent anyways i think you will doubt the quality of the earnings in first well, place if there is no justification yeah if there is no uh, uh, well justified well justification for that particular variance and once it is once it is reasonably close number i think pat is a very reasonable number you can get correct fair enough yeah. so you derive the value yeah okay. so i mean i just take the pat which is a free cash flow number for me sure. i mean after making all the adjustments and uh, i then take the uh the growth for whatever time i am comfortable with 
And then you take a terminal number post that? Yes, I use a terminal number for 3%, okay. which is a perpetual, I mean, perpetual sure. growth rate of 3%. Sure. And uh, then I discounted at a rate of 10%. 10%? Yes. Okay. Okay, too conservative for me, but yeah. Uh, can you explain the rationale behind the 10%? Uh, you know, one, it is a round number, so it makes the calculations in my mind very easy <laughs> for me. Sure. If I make it 11 or 12, I'll have to go back to Excel, which which I don't like. Okay. So, okay. so I like to make a lot of mental calculations. And once I have this, so once I make a standard benchmark, so I can compare a lot of companies on the fly without having referring to their numbers. Back of the envelope calculation becomes easy. Uh, back of the mind, I would say. Okay, sure. <laughs> Just to put a point, but that should not be the rational for. No, no, that is just. I mean, that is one part of it. The second part is. Uh, the AAA bond yield is seven to eight percent. Sure. So if I were to invest in a very safe asset, I would put all my money in a AAA bond yield, which will sure. get me seven to eight sure. percent. So if I am taking the risk of investing in equities, I should be paid or rewarded for investing in equities. So a two or three percent premium. Uh, fair, fair enough. I mean, so that is what I look for. So that's that's. So I think that only difference is that I expect slightly more premium, but and then in that case uh, selection becomes slightly more restrictive. But uh, let me ask you, Ankur, since you are doing a very conservative estimate in terms of your discount rate, right? Um, you know, I mean, if I if I think like a concentrated investor, which you are, wouldn't you be better off taking a more higher discount rate numbers so that you get far more, far lesser companies first of all in your valuation range and secondly the one you will get uh, will be extremely at a reasonable price and thirdly um, from the equities in itself um, shouldn't the premium be above the normal debt cost which is there in the market. So let's say a corporate can generally take a loan at around 11 to Shouldn't you be expecting more money when you're using your discount rate? Or see, one view can be very simple that, okay, discount rate is just a number I can take 12, 13% also and it won't make a difference. But I'm just asking, just trying to get your thought process behind that. Have you never given a thought to that debt ratio vis-a-vis -vis the equity premium? No, I mean, no. the 11 or 12%, first of all, that is a pre-tax number. For, for a corporate who's borrowing. So for him, I mean, after tax deductions, it's it's much lesser. Sure. So the number of 10% is higher than, status, I mean, mathematically, that number is slightly higher. Fair, fair, yeah. Now, my sense is that I want to put a lot of emphasis on the quality of the company which I'm buying. I, so I try to keep the standards of the company which I buy very high. Sure. So the conservatism part, so I would say 80% of my time and my um, mental energy is spent on looking at the business, the company and the management. The valuation is like 15 to 20% time I spent on valuation. Same, same. I mean, same for me, I'm just trying to yeah, so, get more answers there. So yeah. w the point number one is that my confidence or my comfort, I would say, comes from the, the quality of the entry barrier which is around that company. Sure. Right? So uh, I uh, do not... Uh, derive a lot of comfort by taking a higher discount factor. Okay. I mean, Fair so you come at a value number using this. Do you also apply a margin of safety after the calculation of this value? Just like a norm? norm? Yeah, I usually, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I uh, apply a 25% margin of safety. Fair enough. So now again, back to the question you started. Mm -hmm. How high so, is too high? Yeah. So, so you start with a yeah. number. Till what point are you going to hold it? So, I mean, I would say that... Uh, Based on a lot of iterations which I've done right. on the return calculations, what kind of returns you can get if the price moves up beyond the intrinsic value sure. and up to what intrinsic value. So th that number is something around 1.75 times to 2 times my estimate of my intrinsic. conservative intrinsic value. Okay. For example, for example, there is a company A and I have, you know, uh, I have conservative, I have a conservative estimate of 1000 rupees per share of per share of that value of that company. Sure. Now, the point number one is that I am already truncating the life of that company to 10 or 15 years. Sure. Sure. But I know with a very high confidence and a very high conviction level that this company is going to stay for a long period of time. It's not only for 10 years. It's going to stay for 20, 30, 40 years, sure. right? Even more than that. Mm -hmm. So that 
uh, th that also gives a lot of uh, margin of safety by the long runway that this company has ahead of it. Sure, sure. And two, once, so the conservative, conservative estimates are already inbuilt into the workings. Right. And once the market has recognized that opportunity, right. you know, I am hesitant to take my profits from that opportunity sure. because the market has now realized uh, uh, the the uh, potential of this company, sure. but over a period of time, like I said, I try to keep a hurdle rate of seventeen percent. Over a period of time, as the price keeps on moving up, the expected return from that opportunity will keep on dropping. Sure. So, at certain point of time, uh, I would say I did these workings that at what price the expected return will drop to twelve percent, at what price will the expected return drop to eleven percent, sure. right? right? And secondly, you know, uh, it usually doesn't happen that you have invested in a company and it has become, it has crossed your intrinsic value within six months. Sure. Sure. So it usually happens, usually, over a long period of time. Sure. So let's say two or three years. By that time, you have got more insights about the company because you are invested in the company, you are in uh, more about the company. So a lot of nuances about the company which you are earlier unaware of, right. uh, they get clarified in your mind. Right. And uh, you can be more, you can look farther ahead sure. about that company. Initially, let's say you were looking at eight years, now you can say, okay, I'm more confident. You know, whatever I thought, this company has demonstrated it. Sure. So sure. now this company can go from eight years to 12 years or 14 years or 15 years. Sure. So the, that iteration in my mind has given me some kind, uh, uh, a number of 1.75 times to two times the intrinsic value. Sure. At that point, I mean, if my, value of my stock reaches 1.75 times the intrinsic value, then I look very hard at it. Sure. That is my thesis still in place? Is the company delivering as much growth? And what are the headwinds which the company can expect? What is the kind of competition? And if I think that there are, uh, the, the, the thesis is diluting, sure. then I start to lighten up my position. What is the thesis not diluting? So let's say you know you estimated a 25% growth rate right. in a company, mm -hmm. and uh, you do your reworking after it reaches 1.75 or two times your intrinsic value number. Right. You did the reworking, and probably the number is, uh, I mean, you can anticipate the same growth level, maybe even higher. Right. But the, given all those facts, let's say the intrinsic value doesn't take change much. Right. And uh, value is still high. Uh -huh. Do you not sell, or do you uh, lighten up your position slightly? No, I, I start lightening up my position. So, so thesis changing is not important, valuation is more important. Yes, valuation at some point of time, it becomes a very critical factor. Sure. So at some point of time, yes, I do this lighten pretty, up my position. This is pretty interesting, Ankur, because, uh, you know, uh, we earlier interviewed Gaurav Soup on, on the same subject as well. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is, uh, uh, doesn't this would make you uh, judge your company on quarterly basis uh, once it is crossed your comfort level of valuations and uh, and if the answer is yes then uh, how do you ever ride a hundred bagger uh, i mean you know uh, while i was having this conversation with uh, gaurav mm -hmm. uh, his ability to forget about the stock probably helped him on couple of occasions to ride couple of hundred baggers so uh, just curious to know so i mean uh, if, if i have to just reframe that whole thing also uh, a company which will be a sort of a multi-bagger in the long run uh, generally tend to overshoot in value right a few number of times in that holding period right right uh, on those time and i am a proponent of doing that part but i'm just saying that on those times uh, do you take a decision of lightening your position and then re-entering the position when the valuations come to a comfortable level and like Gaurav said that he will hold it on for a very long, long time and right. not get swayed by the value till the point the thesis is intact. Uh -huh. But I think you are saying that the valuation is uh, equally important or sometimes more important uh, and you might want to exit it and then probably re enter it. Is that, is that what will happen in your case? And do, when you say lighten, do you say, uh, do you exit a major position or a very small position? How does it matter? How does it work for you? Uh, well, Gaurav is quite experienced in this field, so I have a very short, you know, history to because I started practicing this kind of investing only, I would say four to five years back. So I my uh, answers are dependent on the kind of experiences which I had. Sure, sure. 
Now, my sense is that once a position becomes a very large part of the portfolio, which I, if I am starting with eight positions or seven or eight positions, so they already are like 13 to 15 percent of my portfolio. Sure, right. Now, if a position is going, and I'm buying at a discount to my intrinsic value. Sure. Now, we are taking a case where the price has doubled or it has, you know, become twice of the intrinsic value. Sure. So that position, in and if other positions have not performed as well as this position, so this position will become a very large part of the portfolio. So that makes me slightly uneasy. So yes, I, I do I sell all of it? No, I don't sell all of it. But do do I sell? Uh, do I lighten up? Yes, I do lighten up. That gives me some peace of mind. Sure. And if the price falls, I can look at it again. Sure. And maybe I can learn from it. But yes, I mean, uh, uh, a very large position in the portfolio does give me some kind of. And if the valuation is also high, you know, sure. a very large position. But with a very steep discount in the intrinsic value, that does not give me jitters. Sure, got it. I, I can, I can hold a very large position. Twenty-five percent is not a sacrosanct number. I mean, twenty-five position, twenty-five percent position with a very steep discount to intrinsic value, and a very high amount of confidence, conviction in the growth and the management and the future of this company, no problem. But a twenty-five percent position or a thirty percent position with intrinsic value, with price double the intrinsic value, mm -hmm. you know, there are so many. Sure. Unknowns, sure. which are lurking around, sure. maybe I would lighten up. Sure. Yeah. So, um, and I do. Right. <laughs> sure. So, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's going really well because I, I have really taken a lot of just about the valuation part also, which is something any new person struggles with, and I'm really getting a lot of insights there. Um, tell me one thing: uh, when it comes to selling of a position. Where you have spent so much time, okay. Uh, when you ought to replace it with a new idea, all right. How difficult it is for you to have a new idea, which probably will have never that much of comfort with, to replace a new uh, the existing idea which you know inside out. Right, a new idea probably will take a lot of time to you, for you to get that comfort. Uh, if you sell on the basis of valuation, do you replace it even if you're not that confident of the new idea? No. Okay. So, so I mean, there are two parts to your question. Sure. Part one, if I am not comfortable with the idea, so I would not, you know, it will not enter into. No, no, I didn't say that. So what I'm saying is that uh, you will never be as comfortable as you were with the old idea because that's a part of your portfolio. And considering whatever I judged from your style, you've been mm -hmm. the companies for a long, long period of time. Right. That means you know far more about the companies which are in your portfolio mm -hmm. compared to the ones which are not part of your portfolios. Mm -hmm. So. Isn't replacement of one company because of any reason? Because of the thesis going wrong or valuations being expensive? Because of any reason, does it create some trouble for you to do the replacement part, uh, or you just go ahead with, let's say, replace a big chunk with two companies and then keep on increasing your positions? How do you go about that? See, if the thesis there is a mistake in the thesis, then there is no question about it. I mean, whether you have a replacement idea or not. If there is a risk which has which has um, um, emerged in your thesis, and you feel quite worried about it, mm -hmm. then there is no question of a replacement idea. You just sell it. Sure. So, so that is that is an easy decision. Sure. Point number two, yes. I mean, uh, the new idea is always going to be. I'm going to know less about the new company as compared to an existing company. Sure. But that call has to be made. If not all at once, we'll have to do it partially. Sure. As you gain more confidence, or as the price makes you, you know, more confident. A 20% drop in a price in the new idea, which will, with with, a, with an equally good quality, sure. Sure. which will make you much more. It will give you the impetus to act. Okay. So. One does it over a period of time. Sure, uh, you know, in the selling only, there's another component which I wanted to inquire you about. Is that um, again, I'm trying to draw some parallels from you know various investors. Uh, some people have a price parameter to uh, let's say on the risk management side. Mm -hmm. Some people have a price parameter that if my thesis, uh, I could be. Perfectly worked. I, I could have really worked on my thesis, but it, market may not recognize that particular thesis. Mm -hmm. So some people have a timeline-based 
uh, risk management. So let's say Monish Babra says that I give it to a couple of years and within a couple of years it doesn't get recognized, then it's better off because of the opportunity cost involved. Some people have a value-based criteria, sorry, price-based criteria that if it falls below this price, even if I am confident on the company, uh, I would probably tend to be a slightly more uh, cautious, even though I understand that you know it goes against the perfect mm -hmm. uh, philosophy of buying a dollar for 50 cents, with a 25 cents you should buy more. But I'm just saying that, do you face those kind of issues in your risk management or do you define your risk management in an entirely different way altogether? So one part of risk management you explained, that you're slightly more concentrated. So how do you keep a track of opportunity cost vis-a-vis -vis the downward downside of your companies? So one, I don't keep a timeline. First of all, when I when I look at companies, as I as I explained earlier, I mean, I try to spend a lot of time on selecting the idea. Does this idea meet the criteria to enter into the portfolio? Yeah. But once it enters the portfolio, I am quite reluctant to cut the position if it has not performed, provided the thesis is correct. Now, uh, you know, I mean, we can take so many examples where, for example, I was just reading about a company. So for good five years, the market gap of the company remained the same. I mean, there, there, were, there were movements up and down. Despite the company announcing a very big special dividend and doing a buyback in the interim of those five years, because the promoters knew, you know, they very uh, ethical promoters and they knew that the intrinsic value is quite higher, so they also did a buyback. But nothing moved the market. The stock was still selling at the same valuation which it was selling five years back. And then in the next two years, the stock jumped up eight times. So a guy who was impatient after three years or he said, I want to sell after four years, I want to sell after five years, you know, because this is something which I don't have the ability to figure out that when the market, I know the, I know what is the intrinsic value of the company or I can fairly, you know, deduce the intrinsic value of the company. The price is a fact which the market is providing. Sure. I don't know when that gap is going to close. Sure. So your risk management essentially is the time you spend on judging the company before it comes in your portfolio? Yes, I spend a lot of time and uh, I would say I, I thoroughly read 80% of whatever has been published about that company. Sure. So I, I go back to 20 years, 30 years, 40 years of annual reports. I'll, I'll really, you know, uh, look at every tube, uh, video on YouTube which has been posted on that particular management, any interview. Sure. So I try to uh, basically tick all the check boxes which are there in my criteria before I s decide to select a company. Got it. So that is point one about the risk management part and point two is also about the diversification. You know, I'm not investing all my money and, and the, the logical question could have been that if you are so confident about one company, why don't you put 100% of your money in one company? No, actually you've already answered it. 10% of the corpus into one company is anyways concentrated. I mean, by normal definition. No, even, I, I'm saying, I mean, you know, even, uh, let's say, even even amongst those 10 companies, sure. the expected return would be not be the same for all sure. the time. Sure. There will be some companies which are offering, let's say, 5 or 7% higher return. Sure. So you know, so, uh, need to have some margin of yeah. so, by sheer logic, yeah. one should invest all, in, all the money in one company. Sure. So, the but risk money. probably amount to, I mean, I may be wrong in speaking out of line, but that probably amount to arrogance. Money. Correct. No, no, so I know, know it all. That's, that's, uh, no, so that was that I was coming to that the risk management part is investing not in one company but investing maybe in seven or eight companies sure. where where your conviction doesn't turn into arrogance right. and where your conviction also doesn't turn into uh, not, ignorance. Sure, not knowing what you know. Yeah, not knowing what you know. So right. seven or eight companies, I think, and the probability that all seven or eight do, do not perform for five year period or a seven year period, I think. The probability is not yeah, zero, but it is low. It's very low. Just again, you know, uh, sometimes you uh, test the thesis in your mind, right. asking some hypothetical question, which and probably this is slightly hypothetical. But let's say if it doesn't work for two or three years, and you said that you were comfortable holding it for five years, my question is always that that um, uh, there is a presumption in that holding of five years that 
your thesis is extremely solid. Correct. And um, uh, let me put it this way that you are saying that I am correct and the market is wrong in this particular case. And you are going to say that for five years the market is still not recognizing and I know the correct value. Um, where, so my previous question was also on the blind that mm -hmm. is there a point where there is a doubt that comes into your mind that okay am I not looking something which the market is or that doubt never comes because as per your understanding you probably looked at everything which is possible over the company. No, that would be quite incorrect to say that doubts don't arise whether the market agrees with your valuation or otherwise. Right. Doubts about the company should always, you know, they are always in the, in the mind, whether you are confident or not. Right. So all, about all my ideas, I have different kinds of doubts in, in the thesis. Right. Right. But some are reasonable. But they don't move your conviction. Yeah, they don't move the conviction and uh, those are risks which you are willing to take. Sure. Sure. For example, let, let me just get back to the theory of Sera sanitary wear. Sure. Right. So what is the risk in sanitary wear? I mean, all the other things are in place from my perspective, but the biggest risk I think in Sera is the single uh, location of the factory. You know, Sera is uh, producing 3.2 million pieces of sanitary wear just from one single location. Now, God forbid because of any natural calamity or any such thing, a, a union strike or a lockout, you know, the, the Indian corporate industry has been witness to so many uh, labor union, labor strifes. Sure. And, and many other things. Sure. So what will happen to that company? I mean, the earnings potential of that company and maybe possibly if they are not able to solve that problem within a reasonable period of time, what will happen to their market share, the brand recall and so many other things. Fair enough. So, but I think that will be a temporary problem. I know. No, but it's a risk. I'm, I'm sure. saying it's a risk. Sure. Yeah, so that's a risk which is worth taking and it will be diversified by investing in seven or ten companies. So, yeah, I wanted to ask you is that when you buy, uh, and you said you are comfortable holding it for five years, that's mm -hmm. fine. But when you're buying it, at that point in time, is valuation vis a vis the potential of the business the only criteria? Or you also keep a trigger in mind which will probably help market realize this potential of this company? A catalyst. Maybe. And the catalyst or the trigger becomes more important if you are. Um, you know, in kind, in risk arbitrage situations as well as in cheap asset situations, because um, we all know that the, the, the Indian markets are not that uh, open to activist investing and all that stuff. But right, right. Uh, in these kind of companies, when there is uh, too much of gap between intrinsic value and valuations uh, um, and uh, intrinsic value in the prices, uh, is there any kind of a thought toward what will lead to the closing of the gap price value price value gap? Or do you go ahead with an assumption that this cannot stay for very long anyways, so let me just go and buy it no matter what? I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm convinced. No, no, I, I got your question. Right. See, I mean, that kind of thought process I used to have when I used to invest in companies which are deep value stocks. Sure. Right? That's a, a very important criteria anyway. Yeah, company sitting on value surplus value land value. or company yeah. sitting on hordes of cash. What will happen to that right. cash? But investing in very good quality companies is, I think, a different world altogether from investing in companies where a, lo a big part of your intrinsic value is passive in nature. Here, a big part of your, or I would say almost all of your intrinsic value is not, is active in nature. Which is, which is, which is, you know, which is, which is being demonstrated in the p &L statement of the company. But you're saying the performance in itself is a trigger. Yeah, so it's getting translated into the earnings of the company. So if the price doesn't uh, move as per the earnings of the company, it's getting cheaper and cheaper in that. And sooner or later, sooner market later will realize market it. Well, it, has to. it should. That's the hope, yeah. <laughs> well, I would say it should. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's what value investing is all about, isn't it? Uh, history has it that market does realize its mistake. Okay, so and yes, over a period of time, and over a portfolio of companies, yes. I mean, I, I'm still to come across an idea uh, uh, which was not a mistake, which was a good quality company, which was selling a deep value, I mean, inter with a good margin of safety and nothing happened for five to seven years. It should, it should have been having a margin of safety, I mean, from the price that Would we you have. categorize Noid at Allbridge as one of those companies? Well, no, no, Noid at Allbridge is not a good quality company. 
I have not studied the country, no, no. but I'm just saying that a lot of uh, uh, fraternity of people we talked to and they were very positive in the company. The no, the there is no growth, right? Fair enough. I mean, let's not discuss about yeah. uh, There's a lot of political sorry, risk, yes, sir, regulatory yes, risk. Yes, no, 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 so no. Well, I did invest in Noida Tone, just to clarify. But at that time, I was, yeah. At that time, it was a debt reduction theory, so I invested in that company. Okay, so um, Akut, uh, I know you buy companies when they fall more because it is cheaper to you, and you have worked since you're confident on your working mm -hmm. and your valuation calculations, and you're conservative in your valuation calculation. If it falls further below, I think it makes reasonable sense for you to buy them. Uh, Provided, yes, if I have liquidity, yeah, have liquidity. yes, yes. My question is, do you also buy the companies which are performing well and they may not be at that margin of safety levels, but you can still foresee a huge amount of runway in front of them? So let me put it this way. Do you pay a premium, uh, uh, you know, premium for the valuations which you have calculated uh, or the margin of safety is paramount? Now, I understand that sometimes that uh, margin of safety is coming from the fact that you're able to see the runway for a long period of time. Right. In itself is a margin of safety for you. Uh, so, but I'm just saying that do you still keep the 25% margin of safety as a matter of fact? Or will you be comfortable buying a company which is at your intrinsic value calculations with conservative estimates, um, but it is not at 25% to intrinsic value? And you can see 10 years ahead or 15 years ahead or 20 years ahead. Well, that's a quite a difficult call to make. Yeah. I still, uh, you know, 25% is just a ballpark number to give me some kind of guidance. Sure. So 25%, I mean, if the company is available at a 20% discount and I'm extremely, extremely, you know, gung ho about, about the investment idea, then I may, may put the trigger to buy. But 25% is just a ballpark number. So my return calculation is actually uh, I want to have 17% uh, is the hurdle rate as I actually I mean initially mentioned. Sure. So if if the company has moved ahead in price and still delivers me on my calculation the 17% IRR, I have no doubts in my mind to increase the position. Sure. Okay. Provided it is also within the risk framework that is this is the maximum position which I want to buy. Sure. Uh, what what is that uh, for your current risk management? Uh, 20%. 20% is the maximum. Yes. At cost. Yes. Sure. And is there a number at, ma at the current portfolio value, if it goes to a certain number, you start liquidating? Or that does not matter? No, no, no. I don't liquidate if it reaches a particular percentage number, but on the basis of, again, host of factors, thesis, valuations, gaps. Got it. Sure, sure. Uh, so, Anku, uh, let us go through some of the failures you had in terms of um, ideas or in terms of processes which have really changed the way you work. Okay. Uh, because, you know, failures teach you more than successes. So, Correct. Uh, what few defining moments in your mistakes changed the way you work or changed your process of evaluating companies? So give me some examples of your failures. Okay. So, uh, I know an automatic comfortable question. No, no, no. I, I mean, I, I'm thinking where to start. I mean, which? <laughs> oh, I thought there won't be many. No, 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 no. I'm just thinking. I mean, you know, it should be beneficial to people who are listening. So, right, which sure. idea should I uh, throw open right. for questioning? So, I would say, as as for the concept, one concept is about investing in half baked ideas. You know, when you have not. You think that you know the company, but you actually don't know the the way the business works or the economics of it. Sure. It's a half-baked idea, and there is no, uh, I would say, objective criteria as to what, how much work is sufficient work. I think that, you know, that 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 voice has to come from within. That right. now I understand sure. how this is working. The, okay, so I will talk about two processes in, in and then if I can think about more. So one part is about half-baked ideas. Right. You know, you get onto, you read a, you know, something about an idea right. and you uh, download some annual reports or maybe you read some interviews and you get a hazy idea about it. But in your mind you think, you know, you have... Know all. Not know all, but you have already you have covered the ground sufficiently right. to take the position. Right. So that that the itchy finger to take the position and quickly move your money right. else the valuations will go up because this guy has talked about this idea on the forum or this has he has come out with the interview 
so chasing the idea with half baked conviction i would say that is the the, the prime most uh, folly to commit so if I, so i i used to buy uh, because i used to have as i told you i used to have 50 to 60 40 to 50 companies so a 2% you know position or a 3% position actually doesn't matter much in your mind right. even if you lose you don't care right. but you want to get on to the bus quickly sure. before before this idea you know moves out of your sure. sight i think you hit the uh, nail on the head sure. this is the psychology yeah, I, I should not miss it that is just 2% let me get on with it yeah and to become a part of the crowd because yeah. if if you talk about a company that you have made money in it sure I should also be, you know, be in a position to say yes. I also hold that company, whether it is one share or ten shares or hundred shares. <laughs> sure. So that that philosophy that costed me a lot of, and it created a lot of anxiety within me, sure. Sure. because you know, you need a very calm mind right. when you are, and and to enjoy the process, you ought to have, you ought to derive a lot of nectar out of it, a lot of juice out of it. Well said. But if you are very anxious, you are looking at the prices on a periodic very quick basis you are looking at at quick intervals you are looking at the price then the, the calmness of your mind mm-hmm. it goes away and the best decisions are made when you are you know your mind is still right. as, as they say when you are in the zone right. so in order to reach that zone you ought to be very calm you ought to be away from anxiety sure. so that half baked ideas used to make me very very anxious in in a lot of ideas i would find that i have shot first and then i am trying to aim i have invested first and now i am trying to you know go back what this guy said or what did this guy do 5 years back or 8 years back got that so gradually as i started moving towards more concentrated positions and it's a feedback loop or it's kind of a you know a structure it's kind of a foundation the deeper the foundation mm. the, the more stable is your idea or the more stable is your philosophy and the more stable is your mind mm. you know in times of volatility if you haven't done your work properly and the stock drops 30 40% then you can you can go bonkers sure. but if you have dug very deep and you have got your foundations very very deep uh, then then there is no need to worry sure. so that is one one concept i would say that working on working and acting on half baked ideas sure. and two i would say meeting the managements sure. so earlier what i used to do i mean meeting the management was a key criteria before i actually you know invest in a stock so even before i have completed reading of the third annual report i would have already shot a mail to the company to grant me a meeting with the cfo or the ceo so a lot of my mind mental energy my mind uh, mental bandwidth and my time would get wasted in getting those appointments i would go and meet the company as a, and as buffett says that you know you don't need to ask a barber if you need a haircut so you don't need to ask the company if the company is good or not i mean you are only going to get that's pretty interesting so at when you were investing 2% of your purpose you were keen on meeting the management and now that you have concentrated you realize that there's no <laughs> point meeting them <laughs> yeah because you know you have you have already read whatever is there to sure, read right. sure interesting you know whatever you don't know about the company even the management will not be able to tell you right. well, definitely because they themselves know what is uncertain right. you are trying to figure out the uncertainty part which they themselves are uncertain so even if you get an answer from them no use no additive value to it it doesn't add any value it only gives you psychological uh, confidence that you have met the management so what i mean and on the negative side obviously uh, their confidence can rub off and, precisely uh, and give you a false picture you are completely right it has happened me with a, with me a couple of times that meeting a management has actually worked in a counterintuitive way right. it has actually worked in an adverse way so yeah, i mean i'm i'm with you on that because uh, my premise is always on the management is that whatever the management is doing forget what they're saying whatever they're doing is visible correct i mean it's, it's there in the numbers it's there i mean if you're looking for the forward looking statements it's a different matter altogether but even those are available in the annual reports if you want to look at the prospects of the industries and if say something changing and all that stuff uh, but meeting the management unless and until you really uh, you know so initially we used to meet the management because we thought it's a good idea uh-huh. to meet the management right right you know? uh, because uh, a lot many were investors have said that it's a good idea to meet the management but the more i have met management the more i realized that i'm better off uh, doing my research if at all there's something which i need a clarity on then it's a different matter but most of the clarity comes in your process anyways uh, 
very well said puneet so i'll 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 just i mean uh, you know share my thought process right now what i how i think about it sure. so i would say as mangar says that there are he, there are three baskets you know when they are looking for ideas either it is in or out or too complex right all right so i thought why not try this idea when we are trying to work up on a company or trying to meet the management you know trying to get that logic why to meet management sure. in the first place sure. So if the if the idea doesn't inspire you in the first place, if you have to spend a few days working on the idea, and there are you know a lot of risks which you foresee in the investment idea, right. then it is already in your outre. Right. So there is no need to read up on that company. There is no need to meet the management. Right. The second. bucket is the in bucket if the idea if you have worked on it and you are gaining confidence day by day by reading up more and more and trying to understand going to the marketplace you know if it's a product company it's available and you are able to build your confidence day by day then at some point of time you have got that critical mass of confidence where you don't need to meet the management you know everything is there in the public domain right now going that extra mile and trying to meet the management is only wasting your time and the opportunity cost got it yes if you meet the management maybe there are certain uh, portions which are not clear to you they may get clarified but you also carry the risk of getting over influenced by it sure so that and and i would say a good bunch of ideas i would say 70 to 80% of the ideas they will either fall in your out basket so there is no need to meet the management 10 to 15% of the ideas might fall in the in basket where you don't have the necessity to meet the management right 5% of the ideas i would say would fall in the complex too complex basket which you can't outlay out rightly reject but you are also not able to get a handle on the business right, right? so there for example i mean even buffett for example uh, he made uh, the management of geico so till that time he did not had any understanding of the insurance industry right. but if you look at it now the insurance is the is the workhorse yes. of workshire hathaway right so had he not met the management for an insurance company maybe he wouldn't have got the insights into the insurance industry right so i don't have i i keep an open mind but that is not a predetermined criteria to make an investment but i also know that out of every 20 ideas that i would work the need to meet the management to understand the business because i like that business but i'm not able to understand it would be like 1 in 20 or 1 in 30 sure got it so uh, interesting you said that on management also i have one uh, one thing which i have from my personal i just thought i'll just add to it is that sometimes i have realized that meeting the management of the company you are interested in is probably going to give you lesser insights than the management of a company in the same industry just because uh, the tendency of people to discuss ideas is different so i'll give you some example I, without naming the company i was uh, uh, working on a consumer durable company and i wanted to understand it um, and i have there was another company i have no interest in but uh, i just knew that this guy gives a far better perspective on the industry mm-hmm. uh, so i always used to meet this guy to understand the company i was interested in right 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 so uh, So it's not necessary to meet the management of your company, the one you are interested in or invested in, to get the real idea of how things are moving. See, the basic idea is to understand the business. Right, right. Right now, management is difficult to. There is opportunity cost of time also involved because the management is difficult to you know get a hand on. Sure. To get interviews with the right people, and sometimes it also happens that you might get negative experience meeting a management. for example i mean munger talks about munger talks in oid about an example where these guys they met a company they were you know they were quite confident about the business and they wanted to invest in it but somehow they got the connection that this guy can introduce you to the ceo of the company and so they went ahead and met the company mm-hmm. and they got so cheesed off with the overall experience of meeting this guy he they found it to be very um, very arrogant guy and uh, so whatever i mean not a pleasing personality so they decided not to invest in the idea and that was a missed opportunity and and uh, munger says that it went on 
20 years it went on compounding the you know the the value 20 years 20% year on year and every time they looked at that company they would feel kicking themselves right. it went ahead for 15 20 years 20% year on year so your personal likes and dislikes can act as a bias yes interesting and plus i mean there is no need it doesn't add, add too much of value Um, so, Anur, you talked about uh, the failures, and uh, uh, let's uh, probably end it on a positive note. Uh, tell us something about your successes, the home runs that you've hit over over the years. I know the one you have missed, Ashram Motors, because I was there in the presentation. Which one? Ashram Motors. I think you. Uh, Which one? Ashram. Ashram Motors. Motors. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that because. Uh, uh, I think I was in the class when you presented the idea uh -huh. um, as a special, special right. situation opportunity when I should in Volvo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think you exited at a 40% gain or something like that in the position. Not 40% gain, I mean, yeah, I mean, doubled. Counted 40% gain. Oh, yeah, double, double. Double. Uh -huh. And we all know what happened to Ashir. And you have discussed this with me earlier also in our meetings that uh, Ashir Motor was a big, big. You knew everything and then you didn't invest it in something. And it was a big mess for you to re-enter it. Well, in hindsight, yes. 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 Do I regret it? Of course not. I mean, yes. I, I don't regret it, but I wouldn't say that I knew the company so well. Yes. It was simply I was buying, you know, a company which was available, I mean, where the cash was also at a discount and there was a buyback. So these were the two triggers. Yeah, that, that's why I said it's a miss, not a mistake. A, that's the difference. But, um, yeah, so some home runs you have had some uh, companies which you have stuck for a long period of time and you have made good amount of money. I'm guessing Sarah is one. Uh, Sarah was one. Okay. So I have already, you know, switched that opportunity to something else. But Quantify it as well. Sarah was how many baggers? A four bagger. Okay. okay. And uh, then, yeah, the another one is Relaxo. Relaxo is five, five, six beggar. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, uh, so again, these were morale boosters in the sense because you, if you work on a company very well, and you, you know, uh, crack the code inside out. Sure. You you know the business and you know the competitors, so it gives you so much of confidence that you can basically uh, differentiate between uh, a lot of. You can differentiate, or you you can you know you, you, you can separate the wheat from the chaff. You can actually look at uh, uh, the facts because a lot of people, I mean, if they don't know about the company, you know, they are, they are talking in, in a sphere which is more fictional in the sense because the valuations have gone up. They are not supporting their thesis on the basis of facts. Sure. But if you have done your homework, you know the facts, then you can take a very uh, informed call about your decision whether to stay put or to sell. Right. Because you are basing your decision on the basis of... Uh, hard facts that you have gathered over a period of time. Sure. Sure. And it makes you more, it gives you more strength to weather any kind of adversity also in terms of stock prices. Sure, sure. Uh, okay, so uh, at, at the very end, I would probably want to give the listeners an idea about uh, uh, Anko, the person also. So going beyond your investing, investing life, mm -hmm. uh, how does your day look like? And you know, you said that the calmness is very important in right. this whole process. So right. Do you get into any kind of physical or uh, spiritual activities which helps you keep on the top of your, you know, physical and mental health? So let's let's first go through the day daily routine. So what I usually do, I mean, uh, what I seek in my companies is efficient deployment of capital and the efficient deployment of time of their management. So I try to learn from them and imbibe them in my own life. So, for example, I read about uh, Munger uh, defining Buffett that still at this age he works 70 hours a week. So, to be honest, I mean, I try to keep a check on my own productivity. That how much productive am I as compared to the icon, you know, right. we can keep an icon in front of us and then compare our, our own productivity and how do I improve it. Right. So, that is one. Uh, two, in order to... Uh, in order to read and in order to think, I try to keep all the distractions away. Right. 
so i i usually keep my mobile phone in silent mode for the whole day from 10 to 5 i don't uh, speak on the mobile phone and i also try to keep the laptop away i whatever i mean because i am i i don't like reading too much on the digital medium so i try to take print outs and underline and read and take copious notes about what i'm reading uh because this is a weakness which i found in myself that if i am reading something on the laptop i tend to drift away into a universe of surfing where i'm you know after 45 more minutes or an hour i'm looking at something completely different from what i started with i think you're not alone in this <laughs> so i found it you know not very productive for for the kind of work which i'm doing so i try to stay away from it and uh, fortunately this kind of work that we do it allows us to decide what kind of lifestyle we want to have sure. you know and so i mean i usually try to work from 9 to 5 every day and then i go out and uh, play for some time and i cycle a lot so that is my way of you know doing a physical exercise so i, I keep a bicycle and i cycle a lot sure. i play badminton okay. yeah and i i also play frisbee with my son okay. yeah so i try to keep i mean a very uh, disciplined way of living through the day studying and i usually wrap up my dinner by 7 7:30 and i am off to sleep by 10 o'clock now the, the one part which i am really missing on is getting up in the morning i have been trying very hard to work on that and a lot of people you know that is the best time actually to i have heard about i have heard from people and i have read about them it's a very good time to consolidate your thoughts and a lot of authors write their novels around that time so that is work in progress right thank you uh so yeah it was it was um, it, i mean frankly from a personal point of view also it has been because we belong to the same school of thought it was right uh um, pleasure listening to the thoughts we had discussions earlier in parts and pieces but i think a lot of dots connected today so it was uh, great for me um, i would really thank you thanks a lot thanks a lot i mean it was a pleasure talking to yeah. you yeah Manish was appreciate the feeling there same here same here i have learned a lot and it was it was nothing short of awesome uh, thanks thanks <laughs> well i mean you guys are ending the note on very kind words but it was a great uh, interaction with, for me also because you know it opens up your mind when people ask penetrating questions so you tend to question your own theories and you go back and reflect on your own theories and if there is something which needs to be uh, built upon So thanks a lot for this interaction. Yeah.